All right. From a member, I now have to stop helicopter flight training for three, four, five, six weeks. And he was asking my opinion about how to stay current. And I got to go make sure I turn down the volume over here. And we're going to give it just a minute or two to get a few people logged in. But this is a great question, a really, really good question. Let me refresh my page here. It says error occurred. Let me know if anybody's here. My screen is telling me error occurred. Please try back. That looks good. All right. Looks like we're live. Okay. So I'll get to this member's question. And then we're going to do um, some IMC review, inadvertent IMC, with our operations, Brian, Met Brian Rutledge. So many of you that haven't met him yet or don't know who he is, you're going to learn about Brian. He's going to be available to talk to members and uh, help you with your flight training needs. So, nine people watching. Awesome. So this question, I'll just share it on the screen here, and I get what this young man is worried about. So let me read it to you. So he just emailed me today, and I thought, I'm going to cover this live tonight. He said, Kenny, I have about 40 hours in an Enstrom 280C. I had trouble getting confidence in the throttle, but I just got past that about 35 hours, and the last five hours have been great. Very good pattern flights, decent heli taxis, full power takeoffs are coming along, and now I have to stop for three, four, five, six weeks. Can you do a talk on how to get back into it or a link to an existing talk? Is there a method or is it just do the work and take the time to get the muscle memory back? Thanks, TJ. This is an incredible question. I'm glad that he asked because this is a great time for him to ask that question because I'm sure many of you, depending on where you're at in the world, are probably going to run into this or maybe you can't travel for a little while and you can't get to your flight school. Well, let me tell you my opinion on this. It's a bummer if you can't train for several weeks or a month. I get it. But just rest easy. You won't lose all this as fast as you might think. I shared this with Brian today, and he said, I want to let people know that they should be doing armchair flying. You know, you can be sitting at home, practicing, going through the maneuvers, thinking about them. We are working on the maneuvers right now. Brian is putting together the downloads. He just sent me three of them. Tomorrow it's going to be sunny and 58 degrees. We're going to go shoot some maneuvers. So at least for members, you'll have some fresh content coming out, downloads for the uh, maneuvers that you can take a look at. But you won't lose it as fast as what many people think that you will, okay? It's important to keep your ground study going. Of course, this is a great time to work on your ground school because almost everybody gets behind on the ground. It's just the way it is. Everybody excels in flying and then they get behind on ground. So the armchair flying is a great idea. And what I've seen over the years, many times, somebody takes a break for a couple of weeks and they come back and they fly better than they ever did. That muscle memory is not gonna go away just in a few weeks, trust me. Keep your knowledge fresh. Keep hitting the books, whether you're using HOGS, Helicopter Land Ground School, or you're, whatever you're doing, whatever resource you're doing, stay with it, keep the knowledge fresh, armchair fly if you want, maybe use a home flight simulator. There's a lot of things you can do, but don't worry. It will come back for you. It will come back to you. Even though you're at 35 hours, from the description, TJ, you've got a good handle on everything. You've got those control inputs for flying the Instrum. It'll come back to you. Don't stress over it. So many times, I'll give you an example. I had a guy who was working on a rating and he wanted to fly five days a week. And he got to that learning plateau and I kept asking him if he wanted to take a break. No, no, no. And he literally would drive down here two and a half hours for a lesson. Do a lesson or two with me. Do a lesson, eat lunch, do a lesson, you go back home. He did that five days a week. And then he hit up learning plateau. Then he had something come up to do with his business where he had to travel to California for a couple weeks. And he was so freaked and bummed that he was not gonna be able to fly for a couple weeks. And I said, dude, just, you, it's gonna be okay. Trust me. He goes and does his business travel for two weeks, comes back, and he had the best flight that he ever had when he came back. So taking a break for a few weeks, you're not gonna lose as much as you're probably worried that you're gonna lose. So I just want you to 
relax a little bit, breathe easy, stay after the books, TJ. When you go back flying, you'll be fine. When I was working through my ratings, private, commercial, CFI, over the years, it took me four years from off the street to CFI. And I would save up some money, get some hours, some money to buy flight time, and then I might have to take a couple weeks break. I might even have to take a couple months off. And then I'd go back when I got some more money. And I did that all the way through my training. When I failed my first private pilot rating, I took six months off, hit the books, and when I went back, it didn't take long at all to get comfortable in the aircraft because the flying wasn't the problem for me. The flying was the knowledge, which years later is why I'm here as Kenny Keller, the creator of Helicopter Line Ground School, in case you don't know us. We've been online for eight years. So TJ, that's a great question. I'm glad you emailed me that. And I'm sure many of you around the country are gonna be feeling this pinch. It'll be fine. You'll be okay, I promise. So next we're gonna introduce you to Brian Rutledge, but first I wanna see who all's here. I appreciate everybody being here. 26 people watching, nice, very nice. We're gonna do our best to try to do something every day, keep you entertained. Like I said, tomorrow's gonna be 53, 58 and sunny. We're gonna get the helicopter out and we're gonna start shooting some new maneuvers for Helicopter Line Ground School. We'll share a few of them here with you on YouTube. And each maneuver is gonna have a download in the site. So we'll talk about what's in the PDF file for that maneuver. We'll talk about it. We'll get in the helicopter, we'll go fly it and come back and debrief and then upload that to, to Helicopter Line Ground School so you can watch the video. Then you could download that maneuver PDF guide if you want. And heck, you could put them all together and make your own little maneuver guide if you wanted to. You're gonna be more than welcome to do that. So we'll get to the um, Brian in a minute. Hello from West Lafayette, awesome, Roger. I see Ross from Australia, love it, awesome. Ross, glad you're here. Jason, haven't seen you in a while, West Lafayette, awesome. Paul here almost every night. Rodrigo, hello, Kenny, please hello in California, awesome. Kevin, Michael Worth, I spent a ton of money setting up a really good sim for this, but armchair flying totally works and costs a lot less. Exactly, armchair flying works. Going through the motions, thinking about it. I mean, literally, when I went through the Indiana Law Enforcement Academy, struggled with firearms a little bit, and they told us, all you guys that are, that are struggling, when you get in bed at night, go through the course of fire. And they said, we mean, in your mind, close your eyes and go through the three yard line, the five yard line, the seven yard line, the 15 yard line, all those phases that you go through, literally think about it, drawing your weapon, firing, reholstering, go through that whole entire course of fire, everything that you do with your weapon. And they said, you will be amazed at how much better you'll do out on the range. And they told us how they took a group of um, like a hundred people and 50 of them, they said, we want you to just do nothing for the next two weeks and come back. And the other group of 50 people, we want you to, um, how did that go? Anyway, they, they gave us a scenario where it was about, it was shooting hoops, it was shooting basketball hoops. And it was amazing how much the people that came back only thinking about it versus doing it how well it worked through that mental preparation of just doing nothing but mentally practicing free throws. So there's a lot of scenarios that you can use. So that's awesome. Uh, Steve Bush, hello, Kenny and Heather. Awesome. Heather's already went home for the day. Even though I'm a Robinson fan, I love that. Awesome. Okay. Black answer in the background. Oh, I love it too, man. Nice helicopter. I love flying it. Flying the EC20 autopilot tomorrow. Awesome. Paul, Glenn, hey, Kenny. Paul here in Seattle in quarantine. Well, give you something to do to uh, refresh your knowledge today with inadvertent IMC. Paul Gibbons, Michael Worth, Blue Angels armchair fly every night, awesome. Clarence is here, yo Clarence. And yes, as you always say Clarence, we have Robinson R22, Robinson R44, and Enstrom specific sections inside Helicopter Line Ground School. There you go Clarence. Ron, hey Kenny. Ron B in Phoenix, awesome Ron. Hey Ron, uh, loved hearing from you. A lot of comments you've done with us on YouTube over the, over the past, we appreciate that. Big Bill Theory, Scott Farkas, awesome, hello. Ross, I have my intro flight on Friday, hope it does not get canceled. I hope you get to go too, awesome. 34 people watching, that's awesome. I love it, okay? So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna roll this video where we did a live one-on-one -on -one with Brian Rutledge and he'll tell you in the video a little bit about his background. 30-year aviator, 25-year sheriff's deputy, 
15 years with the Sheriff's Department Aviation Unit. As a trainer, the last um, five or six or seven years he was with the department, okay? So I'm gonna roll that in just a minute. I wanna tell you a bunch of free resources down below. Last few days we've been giving out free resources like crazy. PDF book files down below. Anybody can, can have them, you can download those. And our free, free radio courses down below. We've been highlighting all of our free content. When people are home looking for something to do, Download free books, take a free radio course. If you're Hogs member, you've already got those. Awesome, so you're all here, 38, nice, nice audience. So here we go, we're gonna roll this presentation on IMC so you, our members, get a chance to see Brian, hear from him, and uh, give you an idea of, of kind of what you're gonna be seeing from Brian as he started with us full-time this week. And he's putting together these maneuver guide downloads that we're talking about and uh, actually probably start reviewing those, a few he just sent me while we're rolling this. So enjoy this presentation, and uh, we'll be back in just a little bit. Give us a thumbs up, please. And hey, we're live again, Kenny with HelicopterGround.com. I'm going to turn down my volume here. We are trying something new. Brian Rutledge is here today. He is here from California. He's at home, logged in from his laptop. Real quick, Brian, say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. Brian Rutledge from California. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Cops, ex-cops, retired cops. Chris Hauser logged in. It's one of our instructors you see from time to time. He's still a cop, too. So Kind of crazy how that all works, huh? Brian talked here for a minute. Just... Share Brian with our viewers before we get started with the inadvertent IMC part two. Just give a little background or whatever you want to share with everybody and tell them about sure. what it is you're going to be uh, teaching them today. Sure, not a problem. Uh, like you said, Brian Rutledge, I'm here in California. I do work for a local uh, law enforcement agency. Um, I've been with the department about 22 years. I've been in the uh, air unit uh, 13 years now. Um, it's been a great career. I'm enjoying it. Uh, I got a few more to go and then I'll, I'll be retired like Gary. And uh, uh, the thing that I, I really want to impart uh, to everybody is, you know, what you learn today or what you glean from today, um, take it with a grain of salt, but go out there, do your research. Um, and when it's all said and done, just make sure that um, you constantly are striving to become better each and every day as a pilot. Um, you never stop learning. Uh, you're always going to come across different ideas, uh, different ways of doing things. Uh, take all those tools and put them in the old toolbox and uh, stay safe while you're out there flying. No disrespect to somebody who may be new to this, but last week a couple people said, well, I would never do that. And It's easy to be back on the ground saying, I would never go do that. But if you're new to flying and you're just getting into it, you wouldn't have experienced this yet. It's when you get out into the commercial environment and you get into the real world and you're operating a put, uh, for an operator who's more worried about cash flow and money and the blade spinning, and then let yourself push yourself. So so today's Brian's day. We This is the first time Brian's ever been with us live. So we're excited to have him on here. Brian's a 30-year aviator. He's got tons of experience, and you're going to learn a lot from Brian. So The big thing I want everybody to, to take away from this is that I don't want anybody to think this is the only way um, – that you handle uh, inadvertent IMC. This is something I put together. Um, I've collected information over the years. Um, but the big thing that I really want to impart on everybody is um, don't get yourself into the position where you're going to have to use any of this. Uh, that's really, really important is avoidance. Um, and so I always want to kind of start out by giving people a few uh, stories. And, and I know stories can get a little boring at times if they're too long. Um, but what I've done is I've gone on to the website AOPA, um, and they have a database for um, accidents. And the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to bring up one that's actually uh, local to the California area. And I'm going to pull it up real quick, and I'm just going to read this. And I want you guys to just take note of some of the things that the pilot did uh, that got himself into trouble. Uh, this particular uh, flight was to transport an injured uh, Sheriff's Department canine dog. So you can tell already from the very beginning, you know, it's it's one of their partners, um, you know, canines that's been injured. It had been shot. And so the pilot really wanted to make sure that he could uh, transport this dog. Uh, 
Um, however, uh, this flight was going to take, take, take place at about one o'clock in the morning. The pilot had discussed all the weather conditions um, and he had determined that it was VMC, visual meteorological conditions or VFR flight is what he had planned on. Um, however, he also was aware that there was a weather front that was moving through the area and that he likely would encounter IMC conditions or instrument meteorological conditions while en route. Um, he had made plans for that. Um, however, he did encounter light rain, strong winds, low clouds, and fog. He did not turn around. He continued. Needless to say, once he went into um, instrument meteorological conditions inadvertently, uh, thus I inadvertent IMC, um, he descended, uh, hopefully to try and find the ground, and he did find the ground. He actually hit the ground extremely hard, um, and it was, a, it was a roadway that he had landed on. Um, he just didn't know it was coming up as fast as it came up. Uh, he decided to go ahead and continue flying, got to an airport, landed, and discovered that there had been substantial damage to the, uh, to the helicopter. Uh, nobody was injured. Um, uh, nobody lost their lives. But it's just a real quick story on here's a law enforcement officer that did a weather briefing, knew there was bad weather coming in, got himself in trouble, and, and continued on. Um, so it, it, I want everyone to understand professional pilots make mistakes. Um, new pilots will make mistakes. And the whole goal of this uh, presentation is to hopefully keep you thinking and not allow yourself to get into those positions. So we'll jump real quick into the, into the PowerPoint. Um, on my screen, Kenny, just so you know, I just have uh, slide number two. I know you went over this um, last week, but we're going to recap it real quick. Um, so if you have that up on the screen, uh, basically all it is is what, what is inadvertent IMC, and that's when you inadvertently fly yourself um, from vi visual meteorological conditions um, into instrument meteorological conditions. Um, the whole time you're planning on staying VFR, um, where you're losing contact with the ground visually, you lose that horizon, um, spatial disorientation can set in extremely quickly. And we're gonna talk just real quick about that uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, but if a person ever finds themselves in instrument meteorological conditions, it is one of the most demanding, disorienting, and dangerous things that can happen because you weren't planning it. Um, moving on to uh, the next slide, slide number three. I know we covered this last week too, but there may be some new people that didn't catch it. Um, but when you go to on an IFR flight, you're planning on losing the horizon potentially if it's a, if you're going to be flying into the clouds. Um, but you make those plans. You know ahead of time. You usually go in wings level. You're already adjusted on the um, instrumentation on your aircraft, and you're planning to lose that horizon. It's all pre-planned. Uh, when it's in inadvertent IMC. You have no plan to actually lose the horizon. It happens that quick. And when that happens, if you do not have um, some type of plan of action, uh, the outcome typically is not very good. Um, moving on to uh, slide number four, <clears throat> it's just talking about avoidance. Um, we don't need to go through all these in, in grave detail. Uh, I think a lot of this stuff can be held for additional um, uh web programs, but, it, you know, doing a good weather briefing, first and foremost. First thing I do as a pilot, every morning when I get up, I just look out the window. I just see what's out there. Is it a sunny day? Do I have a low overcast? Is it foggy? Um, and then I have a couple apps. I just take a little peek on my uh, on my cell phone, and I just look and see what the conditions are in the general uh, area that I fly in, just to get kind of an idea in the morning um, what the conditions are. As the day progresses, I may look again a couple hours later and see if there's much of a change. Um, but by the time I get to work, I'll sit down and I'll do a thorough briefing on the computer. And I'll look and see um, what, what, the, what the conditions are, are forecasting. Um, so you always got to do a really good weather briefing. Um, avoiding flight and marginal VFR, uh, that's one of those things where you just have to have, um, have your, your personal minimums. Um, and if your minimums are, you're not going to go out and fly if the ceiling is less than 3,000 feet and the visibility is less than, um, say, six miles, then if those conditions exist, don't go flying. That would, you know, it, that may not be marginal VFR at the time, but it can change. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, for, for new people out there that have not flown in marginal conditions or flown when 
visibility is right at minimums, thousand foot ceiling, three miles visibility. You had better be prepared for what you're about to get yourself into because uh, three miles visibility is not much. And just because they are forecasting three miles, you may get yourself up there and it may actually be two miles. I, I always like to check weather um, ahead of my route, um, especially if I'm going somewhere far. If I'm working the local area as a law enforcement officer, I, I may I may stay within five miles of a towered airport, class, uh, class Delta airport, um, the entire time I'm flying. Uh, but there's times where we may have to venture out and there's no airports for the next 20 miles. Um, so it behooves the pilot, um, whether you're in law enforcement, EMS, or just private, um, if you're going somewhere, you need to be checking the weather ahead of your route and, and have those in route decision points when to turn around if weather starts to get bad. If you are constantly coming down in altitude, um, that's a problem. Um, it, it's time to either land and shut it down and wait or turn around and head back to the airport or to the nearest airfield possible and land the aircraft. Um, we'll move on to the, to the next slide. Um, real quick, this is just knowing the weather. Uh, slide number five, Gary, if you can hear me. Um, it, you know, this here, I just typed these up. I just kind of made them up. Um, but if you look, um, if, you, if you're brand new and you don't understand what you're looking at, these are METARs. <coughs> um, and this is in the raw format. But what I want you to look at is where it says few 044. Okay, so they're saying that there's few clouds at 4,400 feet. Not a big deal. If you look at the next one, overcast. It shows overcast 055, which is 5,500 feet. And then if you look at the next uh, set of numbers, you've got 22 slash 13. That's your temperature dew point. These are important things to look at. The temperature and dew point, they're quite a ways apart. They're about nine degrees uh, difference. And we've got high clouds at 5,500 feet. And we've got a few at 4,400 feet. That's a great day to go flying. I don't see anything wrong with that. But then if you look down at the next one, now we've got, um, we still have 10 miles visibility. But now we've got this scattered layer of clouds and 006, for those of you that are new, maybe not understand this, that's 600 feet. That's pretty low. Um, it is scattered, but if you look at the next one, overcast is 1400. That's not much better. And if you look at the temperature and dew point, 17 and 16. Now the temperature dew point's getting close together. And for those that are new, again, um, if you don't understand what that means, the closer your temperature and dew point get, the more saturated air you have, the more chances of rain, low clouds, fog, uh, obscured visibility. All those things happen um, with, uh, with the moisture in the air and the temperature when they're really close like that, dew point and, uh, and temperature. If you look at the last one, um, you know, it's showing three miles visibility now with light rain and mist, and you've got few clouds at 700 feet, a broken layer at 1600, and an overcast layer at 2200. And your temperature dew points close together, 17 and 15. So taking these three different airports in my area and looking at that, I know that if I departed Sacramento with the conditions that they have, I have, I'm still VFR, but I've got few clouds floating around at 700. Why? There's so much moisture in the air, temperature dew points close together. It's probably going to get worse, especially if there's a cold front coming through. So I take all that information together and I decide whether I'm going to go fly or not. This particular day, Looking at light rain, mist, and feud 700, I'm not flying. Just not going to do it. Um, the boss isn't going to question me. I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to wait for weather conditions to improve. So that's how I do it. Um, again, this is just a METAR. I do that with the TAFs as well. Um, and I do a real thorough briefing um, but before I make a decision to go fly. Uh, next slide up is uh, talking about spatial disorientation. Um, for those of you that have never actually experienced spatial disorientation, I would urge you to find a, a, a qualified CFI who is um, instrument rated um, and that has some form of practice um, and, and, and being very current um, and proficient in taking people out and teaching, teaching you about spatial disorientation while you're in flight. Um, that's what I do with our guys. Um, you, you know, you, everybody should know if you're in any form of, of training or you've been flying for a while um, that the inner ear is everything. And if you try and listen or, or react to what your inner ear is telling you on in, any given flight and you're not using either your visual references outside on a VFR flight or if you find yourself in instrument meteorological conditions, you're not using your instrumentation 
Spatial disorientation can take over. And when that takes over, um, typically it ends in a crash. Um, so uh, you, you really want to be uh, aware of spatial disorientation and the importance of using your instrumentation if you find yourself in a position where you've lost the horizon. Anything you want to add, uh, Kenny or Gary? Okay, sounds good, sounds good. Okay, um, so with the spatial disorientation, just so that uh, everybody understands, I really, I really want to impress this, impress upon the new people that maybe uh, don't have a lot of flying experience. Um, you know, those of you that have been flying for a while and understand this fully, um, you know, just uh, try to try to bear with me on this uh, real quick. But I'll try and cover this as fast as I can. Um, you know, when we start talking about uh, aviation physiology and spatial disorientation, um, you know, your body uses uh, these systems um, to, to determine your orientation in space and your movement in space. Um, your eyes by far are, are the best source of information for you. It's very obvious. You know, I, I, I usually take uh, you know, new people and I'll just have them stand up, put their hands next to their side, close their eyes for just about five or ten seconds, and then tell them lift one foot off the ground. Just lift it up. And typically they wobble a little bit or they have to put the foot back down to gain their balance. Why is that happening? Because they can't see anything. They have, they, they have no visual reference um, with their – position in space. And so it makes it very difficult for, for people to, um, to stand there long term um, with their eyes closed. Or I'll have them walk through the office with their eyes closed. And they tend to slow way down. Why? Because they don't want to bump into anything. They can't see anything. But when your eyes are open, you can, you can react normally. You see things. You have references. Um, kinesthesia um, is the sensation of position, movement, or tension perceived through your nerves and your muscles. It's kind of that flying by the seat of your pants. Um, not something you want to do once you've lost your horizon. You do not want to pay attention to the kinesthesia um, portion of your, uh, of your body because it, nine times out of 10 is going to give you the wrong clues. Um, and then the vestibular system, um, very sensitive. That's that inner ear. Um, you've got the fluid in the ear. Um, you've got these little hair cells that, that deflect away when you make a turn, turn your head, turn your body. Um, when your eyes are open, it's not, uh, it's not anything really that we pay much attention to. Um, but when your eyes are closed um, or you're not looking at a, a visual horizon when you're flying, these senses um, will make you or you, you could find yourself paying attention to those senses because you'll feel like you're in a left turn and you will make an input on the, on the uh, cyclic for a right turn when in actuality you were probably flying straight and level in the first place and now you put yourself in a turn. So that's the vestibular system. Very, very dangerous um, if you pay attention to it and that is how you get yourself into spatial disorientation. Um, we'll skip ahead real quick to, uh, um, I'm on slide number eight. Uh, this is just gonna be talking about some illusions that happen. Um, I take our guys out and I want them to experience just about every illusion that I can get them to experience while we're flying. And uh, one of them is the Coriolis illusion. Um, you know, if you, if you don't have a, a reference to the horizon and you make these abrupt head movements, such as dropping a pin on the, on the floor, you reach down to pick it up, or you look down uh, to change a, a frequency in your radio. And again, we're talking, you're in IMC, you can't see the outside world. Um, and the only thing that's going to keep you upright are those gauges on, on your, uh, instrument panel, um, but moving the head back and forth uh, quickly or bending over and lifting, you know, trying to tune something in on your radio stack, um, the aircraft can immediately get into an unusual attitude. What happens is it just starts out as a slight deflection of the cyclic. The helicopter makes a slight uh, turn to the right or left or a descent or a climb, um, and you'll feel that because of the inner ear, and you'll make um, – usually an aggressive movement with the cyclic stick um, to recover. And all that does is throw off your inner ear, your balance even more, and you end up getting into spatial disorientation rather quickly. This one actually is real easy to get into. Um, the somatographic illusion, um, 
rapid accelerations. Uh, they say during takeoff, but this can also happen um, during straight and level flight. And if you increase that collective and start to speed up and you've lost your horizon, um, it'll feel like you're getting a nose up attitude. Um, and what's the pilot do? He forces the cyclic forward. Now he goes into a dive. Um, same thing can happen when you do a real rapid deceleration. So, you know, if anybody finds themselves in inadvertent IMC, the, the whole goal is don't make uh, abrupt control movements. Uh, you have to stay away from that because that's how you get these illusions um, and they can be very dangerous. Um, then you've got the elevator illusion. Um, if you've got really strong updrafts or downdrafts, um, you may feel that you're in a constant climb or in a constant descent. That's why your gauges will tell you if you're climbing or descending. Um, look at your airspeed indicator. What's that tell you? If, it, if it's increasing speed, your nose is down and you're descending. If you're bleeding off airspeed, what's happening? You are in a climb. Um, you know, you got gauges there. That's what they're there for. Um, so you have to use them. Um, we'll skip on real quick to uh, – we're going to pass the next two or three, and we're going to go to um, aeronautical decision-making. Um, it will be slide 13, and we'll talk a little bit about fitness for flight because I think some people, um, they – they ignore this uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, the, the pilot in command obviously is, is responsible for um, and is the final authority of the flight. Um, doesn't matter if you're going out for fun. If you are working for somebody, someone's hired you to take them somewhere, uh, you work for a law enforcement agency or an EMS company, doesn't matter. You, you as the pilot in command um, are directly responsible for that flight and you're the final authority. So get that in. See, let that sink in deep. You are the one that says go or no go. Nobody else tells you. You, you do it yourself. Um, you have to have limitations, though. That second bullet point. Uh, bullet point. Um, in order to make effective decisions regarding the outcome of a flight, you must understand your own limitations. You have to. Um, if you don't have them, any limitations, you need to find some. Um, we talked about you know not going flying if the visibility and the ceilings are certain conditions. Uh, add in uh, wind conditions. I'm not going to go fly if uh, the wind conditions are you know maybe greater than 10 knots, gusting you know 15 knots. Yeah, whatever it is, as your experience level changes, your limitations will change. Um, and then uh, the last bullet point is uh, pilot's performance during a flight uh, affected by many factors such as your health. That's a big one. Your recency of experience, looks like I got a typo on that one, recency of experience, your knowledge, your skill level, and your attitude. All that stuff comes together, um, and that's, you know, for your performance um, to be a safe and effective, uh, a safe and effective one, uh, you have to take all of these things into, consist uh, into consideration. Um, so if you're not feeling well, you should be flying, uh, bottom line. Um, I, I, I tend to how many times people will show up to work um, sniveling, coughing, sneezing, headaches, um, aches and pains, and they want to go fly. And you're like, why are you doing that? You're, you're, you tend to spend more time thinking about your illness than actually flying the aircraft, um, and that can be a problem. So down at the bottom, I put the I'm safe rule. Um, a lot of people giggle at this uh, acronym, but there's a reason this acronym is out there. Um, it is uh, very, very important. Um, and if you go down through the uh, – uh, through the I'm safe checklist, you know, are you, do you have any illness? Um, are you taking any medications? Have you had sleep? Um, that's a big one. Uh, law enforcement officers, EMS pilots, firefighting aircraft uh, pilots, uh, these guys work a lot of hours and they may not get a lot of sleep and they may be doing a, a 12 hour day with four or five hours sleep and then they're out flying again, you know, the next morning. Uh, that's not, not the safest thing to be doing. Uh, your reaction times are going to be a lot slower. Um, and and in the I'm safe checklist is for every pilot. Um, after the uh, S for uh, sleep, um, A for alcohol, no drinking. You cannot be drinking and then getting in an aircraft and going flying. I've read so many reports where the pilot's uh, blood alcohol level um, was ridiculous. I, I couldn't believe that this pilot actually got in the aircraft and went and flew. Um, and same thing with medications, you know, taking pain medications, things like that. Stay out of the cockpit. Um, F, um, that can be uh, fatigue. Um, you know, if, if you are fatigued, um, you're going to be tired. Think about times when you're driving down the road. How many people have been driving down the road 
And all of a sudden, they kind of snap out of that that haze, and they go, hmm, where, did, where am I? I? I don't even remember the last exit that I passed. It's because they, they were fatigued, they were tired, and they didn't even remember that they, what they, where they'd gone the last 10 miles. Pilots do the same thing, and it's very dangerous uh, for pilots. Um, and then E can be emotion or eating. When's the last time you eaten? Um, did you just have a, a, a big argument with your wife or your kid, and you're just, you're just pissed off like no one can believe? Probably not a good idea to get in an aircraft. So, again, aeronautical decision-making. You've know, you got to be smart about what you're doing. Um, the next slide just talks about hazard attitudes, and the reason I like to throw this one in, meteorological conditions, and ended up hitting the ground hard, um, where would he fall into, in, into the categories here? Is it the anti-authority, you know, don't tell me? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think he was there. Impulsivity, do something quickly. Um, yeah, I think he wanted to do something quickly. Um, invulnerability, it's not going to happen to me. Yeah, I think a little bit of that might have been there because uh, he knew what the weather conditions were. Um, the macho, I can do it. I don't know. Um, it's possible. Um, and the resignation, what's the use? No, that, I, I don't think he fell into that. But if you read any accident, um, the story itself, you could probably fit every single pilot from an accident into one of these categories. So as new pilots or seasoned pilots, you need to stay away from these. You can see what the antidote is. Uh, it's kind of silly, you know. They call it the antidote statement, but they're, they're there for a reason. Um, you know, if you're the anti-authority, don't tell me type of person, um, actually, you need to be following the rules. That's really all they're saying. Let's go on to the next one real quick here. Let's get into immediate actions because um, th this is probably what most people want to know about: is what do I do if I find myself in inadvertent RMC? Um, when well, we talked about the avoidance, always avoid it at all costs. Um, do that thorough weather briefing so you will avoid it. Um, but let's just say you, you didn't do any of those things and you found yourself in IMC. Um, you have to have a plan. Um, one of the big things is uh, you have to minimize distractions in the cockpit immediately. Immediately. Um, you need to fly the aircraft. We've always talked about aviate, navigate, and communicate. Aviate that aircraft. Fly that aircraft. Keep it straight and level. You have to fly. You cannot stop flying the aircraft at all costs. Um, you have to scan your instruments. Now, I'm not going to go into, you know, there's different ways of scanning. There, there's, and maybe we can do another video on that uh, some other time. Um, but you, you have to have a technique to scan the instruments. So um, the only way you're going to have that is if you practice. And the only way you're going to practice is if you go out and you find yourself a CFI that's competent in teaching you these things um, so that you understand what a scan is if you lose the horizon. Um, you want to minimize uh, changing frequencies, putting your head down, looking away from the uh, from the instruments. Um, you don't want to be moving your head around and shifting your eyes all over the place. You want to keep your eyes on the instruments. It's a constant scan. It never stops until you get back into VMC conditions. We'll go to the next uh, slide. We're getting to the end here. Um, so you've gone inadvertent IMC. Immediately transfer your eyes to the instruments and start the scan. You want to get to a zero-degree roll, in other words, level flight. And if necessary, a 500 foot per minute climb um, it isn't going to hurt anything. That's a little five degrees, a nose up, because if you're in an area where there's terrain, I know people across the country and around the world, there's different terrains. Where I fly, we're mostly flatlanders. We're down at sea level, but we do have some, uh, some hills and things that, uh, to the east of our local area that if we were headed eastbound and went inadvertent IMC, if we did not climb, we would crash right into the side of a hill. So um, I put a little thing in there that says um, uh, fly away from terrain if applicable, and I put MEF. That's your uh, maximum elevation figure. So on every VFR chart, you have the quadrant, you have two uh, numbers, and they're usually like a – maybe let's say it's a, a, a five and a, and a three, 5,300 feet, you know, something like that. Uh, know the elevation in your area, and that will dictate whether you need to climb 500 feet per minute or if you need to – or I'm sorry – you need to climb up 500 feet or if you need to climb up 1500 feet it's all going to depend on where you're at but we have a zero degree roll climb if necessary set your airspeed plus or minus five knots um, of what you have practiced um, in you know simulated imc conditions with the flight instructor 
that speed that I have found typically anywhere is around 80 knots plus or minus five knots. Uh, if you got down to 70 knots, that's not so bad. If you're trucking along at 95 to 100, that's a that's a little fast to be in inadvertent IMC conditions or IMC conditions. You just want to slow the aircraft down. It's no different than when you're driving in the fog. You're driving along and you've got fairly good visibility and you're going 60 miles an hour and all of a sudden you hit a fog bank. You're not going to continue at 60, 70 miles an hour. You're probably going to slow down to 40 or 30. Um, just common sense. Slow down. Um, and then a verbal notification. I've got in here because I do teach this to our, our law enforcement officers. Verbal notification to the crew that you are in uh, inadvertent IMC. Well, if you have a passenger um, or you have a friend with you or another pilot, doesn't matter. Let them know you are you are in instrument meteorological conditions, um, and you need to verbalize where are you, what's your location, what's your altitude, and what's your heading. And stay, you have to stay calm. Um, so we got zero degree roll. Climb if you need to. Set your airspeed. Slow it down. Verbalize that you've gone inadvertent IMC. What's your location? What's your altitude? And what's your heading? And you're going to know the, the altitude and heading because you're going to be scanning. And you should know where you're at. You should always know where you're at. So those those right there, location, altitude, and heading should not be a difficult thing to do. 17, the next slide. Um, once you have control of the aircraft, initiated your climb in your own course, now you communicate. You can squawk, uh, uh, squawk emergency code 7700 on your, um, on your transponder. But here's the thing. If you haven't practiced um, flying on goggles, just using the, uh, the instruments, and then reaching over to change uh, a squawk code or maybe change a radio frequency, this is where lack of practice and lack of a plan can get you into trouble. So um, we want to we communicate with ATC. There's nothing wrong with uh, declaring an emergency. It is an emergency because if you don't do something right now and you stay in the, those conditions, your chances of survival go down. Um, if you have no plan and no practice and you can't keep a scan going, you're probably going to end up uh, with a, uh, an accident investigation. Nobody wants that. So declare the emergency, ask for help. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, once the aircraft is stable, only then, now this is a lot of contention, a lot of people will probably disagree with this, some people may agree with it. Um, either way, um, my personal opinion, the way I teach our guys is once they've gone through all the steps of getting the aircraft uh, contained um, and they've squawked 7700 if need be, um, they're up with ATC, um, you're going to get vectors to an airport. You're going to have to turn eventually. You're not just going to keep flying straight. Eventually, you're going to have to turn. Um, so my my thing is, is if I just went inadvertent IMC um, and it was VFR just before I went inadvertent IMC, once the aircraft is stabilized, then and only then, and if I practice, then I'm going to make a very gentle turn and I'm going to do a 180 degree turn to exit the, the IMC conditions. Um, if a person is not has not practiced that, is not competent, I'd still be up with ATC. i tell them what I'm doing. Um, but you have to, you have to, you, you have to decide what's best for you. Um, making that turn, this is where things can get, uh, spatial disorientation can set in rather quickly here. Um, so if, if, the, if the practice has been there and you're up with ATC and you can make the turn, make the turn. But when I say that, no more than about a 10 degree bank, no more than 10 degrees. I mean, and that's it. Go out on a VFR day and just do a 10 degree turn and see what that's like. It's a very slow, slow turn. And you got to keep the scan going the entire time. But before you make the turn, whatever heading you're on, look and see what's the 180 degree reciprocal to that. What is it? If you were flying on a 360 heading, you need to turn to a 180 heading to get out of there. So you just have to make a conscious note of what it is, or if you have a heading bug, put the heading bug on the 180 degree reciprocal, and then a slow, gentle 10 degree turn until you roll out on the heading and then fly that heading. Uh, it's probably gonna take a couple minutes for you to exit, but then you should exit VFR and then go take the helicopter and land at an airport and don't go flying anymore until you've recovered from that. Cause that's that's gonna be a very stressful event for you. But that's about the only, only uh, way to, uh, that I, that I teach our guys is you know, declare the emergency, get up with ATC, and when you're comfortable, make the turns. Um, 
If you don't want to make the 180 degree turn, take the vectors from ATC and they will vector you to an airport. Um, the biggest problem is a panic driven desire to exit IMC or recover from an unusual ab uh, attitude. And that all that leads to is um, a situation where uh, you're going to lose control of the aircraft. Um, and that's the last thing we want. Uh, the last slide, it's a big thing for you to remember, is once you encounter inadvertent IMC conditions, the ground is no longer your friend. Do not lower the collective and try and hunt for the ground because you may eventually find the ground, but it may still be in IMC conditions and you don't want to have that happen. A couple, just a couple of things that came up in the YouTube chat. Taz said, if you ever get the chance to chance to get training in a barony chair, it is well worth it. You really get to see how your body lies to you. I Absolutely. Do you know what that is, Brian? Yeah, and I just a real quick, I went through uh, back in 1987, I believe it was. I was in South Carolina when I went to my primary fixed wing flight training. We went to Shaw Air Force Base. They put us through an altitude chamber. They put us through the chair. They put us through all kinds of things that their pilots go through. And I will tell you, um, your body lies to you all the time when you have no visual reference. <laughs> it is something that if you if you can afford it and you can experience it or you can find find a place to, to experience these types of things, you really should go out there and, and do that because it you'll never forget the experience. Okay, and then uh... – Harley said, what do you suggest for wire strike avoidance? And Taz jumped right in there. Don't fly below the minimum safe altitudes. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, uh, what wire, wire strikes happen more often than people realize. And I still, for the life of me, can't figure out <clears throat> why people will intentionally put themselves in a position um, where they could have a wire strike. Um, there's, there's no reason to be down that low unless your job is to work around power lines that's about the only time you should have an aircraft near a power line is if your work if that's your job that's what you do other than that you need to steer clear you need to stay away from them i went through it uh i went through it pretty quickly but real quick i just want to let people know um after we do the the ground session there usually i do this with one pilot sometimes two and we just have a conversation we go through the powerpoint we talk about different things that they've experienced things i've experienced but when we get in the aircraft what I do is because we all wear helmets, it's kind of interesting and it works out really well, but because we wear flight helmets and we have the visors that, that flip down, um, a, a friend of mine actually turned me on to this, but we use what's called, uh, it's tinted window. Um, it's that stick on uh, film. You can peel it on and off. It doesn't, it doesn't leave any residue on your lens. But what we do is I cut it out so that it fits the, the, the pilot's um, visor and when it's in the down position, it's like wearing a pair of foggles. All they can see is out the little window, and they can see straight ahead onto the instrument panel. So what we do is we depart VFR, and we're flying along, and I'll give them vectors. We're flying, and then I, I usually will say, hey, do you have that traffic out, you know, out their side of the aircraft? Hey, do you got that airplane you know, 2,000 feet and you know, a mile and a half? And they'll turn their head, and they'll look for the traffic. I'll reach up, and I'll put their visor down immediately. And tell them you've just gone inadvertent IMC because usually it's a surprise. You don't know when it's coming. It just happens. Um, and now they they immediately have to transition to uh, to the instruments and they have to fly. And because we do this every six months, they're getting so much better. It's really neat to see how well they've improved. But the first time I did it with them, within probably 20 seconds, we were either in a in a in a climb, in a banking dive. We were all over the place. They were having such a hard time keeping the aircraft straight and level because they just lost their their uh, outside reference to the world, and they had to go to the instruments, and they didn't have any practice. Um, but as we continued to fly, they got better and better. And one of the things I'll do with them is I'll, I'll have them fly along. Um, I'll get on the controls with them, and they'll be straight and level, and I'll tell them to close their eyes. And it's just a demonstration of what the vestibular system will do and how will you react to it. I have them close their eyes, and once they have their eyes closed, I tell them they have the controls. And, of course, I'm, I'm taking precautions. I, I'm their eyes for the outside world. I'm scanning for traffic. I'm handling the radios, and I'm guarding the controls. I'm not going to let them get us into a position where we can't get out of it. 
Um, and that's what an instructor should be doing. Um, but I, I'll tell them, okay, fly straight and level. That's all I want you to do. Don't do anything but fly straight and level with your eyes closed. And every single one of them within 45 seconds or less had the aircraft in an unusual attitude um, just because they were listening to their vestibular system. And I'll make them tell me, tell me what you feel. And they'll say, I feel like I'm turning left. Well, I'm looking out the window and we're not turning left, we're flying straight and level. And then they correct for it and they put us into a right turn. And then they put us into a dive. And then they, and then they'll say, it feels like they're tumbling, like they're falling over. So, you know, those are just little things that I do with the guys to, to really uh, drive home the importance of, of staying on the gauges and, uh, and paying attention to what they tell you. Um, and uh, it's just, just one of those things that we found that worked real well for us. Absolutely. And I really, I, I really want to emphasize to all your viewers and people that may view this uh, later on down the road as a, as a replay video, um, get yourselves out there with a, with, a train, with a good CFI. It's really important. you got to find somebody that has a passion for, for teaching and get out there and, and do some work under the hood. And by all means, if you have the ability to get that instrument rating, get the instrument rating. That does not mean because you have an instrument rating that if you went inadvertent IMC that uh, you're that it's no big deal. Because go to the accident databases and you will find that a lot of the people that that are crashing helicopters are instrument rated. The problem is they're not staying current. They're not getting out there and practicing. So if you're not an instrument pilot, you really need to get out there and practice under the hood with a flight instructor. And I would strongly urge you to pursue that instrument rating because instrument ratings, uh, there's so much involved in flying um, without visual reference. The whole reason it takes 40 hours of flying just to get an instrument rating. So that, that's a lot of training. It's a valuable training. Um, and I, I just can't, I can't stress that enough. All right, there you go. Good advice from Brian. Get that instrument rating, people. It, it helps you become a better pilot. We had a great crowd, man. Still 37 people here. I appreciate everybody's attention. This is good stuff. Uh, I'll wrap it up so you can move on with your evening, whatever you're doing. Remember, there's free downloads below. We've been really harping on all of our free stuff here lately. We have free PDFs all set up for you. They're down below. Free radio course. Heck, man. You know, gobble that stuff up. We really appreciate it. We're going to do our best to keep coming back every day, hopefully come up with some different kinds of things to do, some new stuff, review some old stuff like this. Um, that's Brian Rutledge. So now those of you know him firsthand, at least you've seen him. Some of you got to chat with him there in the um, chat box. So you'll see a lot more of Brian. And I think now you would agree after watching that presentation, you can see what Brian is bringing to Helicopter Line Ground School. It's exciting time for us been talking about it for years six or seven years you know when we first started Brian's like remember me one day when I retire and then here we are seven years later so it's awesome love all the freaking comments it's so cool that everybody's been here make sure you subscribe to the channel click the bell so you be notified when we put out new videos and new live events and uh, we'll just continue on so keep your heads up keep studying keep the nose pointing into the wind and we will see you sometime tomorrow Peace out.